So why don't we come before our God and pray. Please join me. Uh, Father, we want to thank you again for revealing yourself to us uh, in this wonderful chapter of Daniel 3. And Father, we, right now we want to pray for soft hearts and, and hearts that are willing to obey and put this into practice and live for you day by day. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, now, get to know you games have never really been my thing. I've played my fair share of get to know you games in small groups and all that sort of stuff. And yes, they are indeed very helpful because you get to learn things about people that you probably wouldn't otherwise uh, have learnt. But I've never really understood the one that is called two truths and a lie, where you kind of share two truths about yourself and one lie and the other person has to guess which one's the lie. Um, And particularly as Christians, I don't kind of get it because it's just encouraging us to sin, uh, as if we don't need more opportunities to sin, you know. Anyway, in the spirit of get to know you games, what I thought I'd do as we begin this chapter, Daniel 3, is play a bit of, uh, play this game, this two truths and a lie. And I'll start with myself and then I'll I'll explain what we're going to do afterwards. So up on the screen are two truths and a lie about me. And I'm going to ask you to kind of throw your hand up and see which one you think is the lie. Okay, so number one is that I have been in the cockpit of an aeroplane during landing. Number two is that I've been in a bath with an elephant. (laughs) And number three is that I have drunk snake blood. Okay, so who says number one, I've been in a cockpit of an aeroplane? Who thinks that is the lie? No, you're all wrong. This is pre-9-11 days and it's the perks of having a mum who worked for Qantas at the time. I could sneak in. Who says, number two, that I've been in a bath with an elephant? Put your hand up if you think that's a lie. No, you can do that over in Thailand. (laughs) Japanese last year. So number three, I know us Asians, we eat everything, but I'm not touching snake blood. Okay? I'm not touching snake blood at all. (laughs) Even if it is good luck. Now, this morning, we're going to look at Uh, We're going to get to know the God of Daniel 3. And uh, in Daniel 3, there are two truths and one lie here. Uh, Up on the screen, truth number one is this. God says, I'm the real deal. That's true, that he really is God. Number two, that he's a God who can save. And the lie is this, that we can solve and kind of trick ourselves into thinking that God is committed to our own comfort above everything else. That's the lie. We'll come back to that a bit later, but for now, let's look at truth number one, where God says loud and clear that I am the real deal. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar, in case you didn't know, real king, ruled over uh, Babylon, which is kind of modern-day Iran and Iraq. Uh, We're talking back in sort of 600, 500 BC at the time. Uh, There's a picture of him up on the screen. Um, He was the most powerful guy in the world at that time. And what we see here in Daniel chapter 3 is basically him calling the shots on who to worship, who his people can and can't worship. Daniel chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, take a look. This is the order that's given to the people of Babylon. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music, you must, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever doesn't fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into the blazing furnace. Now, you can forget freedom of religion at this time in Babylon. This is prescription of religion. I tell you who to worship, Nebuchadnezzar says. All people, all nations, all will bow down and worship this towering golden statue. What is essentially an eight-story high toothpick made out of gold. That's the image kind of I want you to have in your head. Now, if you don't bow down and worship that, then you'll be thrown in the furnace. And not only that, I'll tell you when to bow down and worship this golden toothpick. It'll be when you hear the horn, the flute, the zither, the triangle, the bassoon, the egg shaker, the maracas. It's kind of ridiculous, this this scene here. That's what the, the, the writer is trying to help us see by listing out all these instruments. Now, here's a question for you. Why is it when you heard our wonderful band this morning, you know, with, with, with the two bands on, on, on piano and on, and on um, and bass and, and Mark over here shredding on the electric guitar, why is it that you did not bow down and worship a golden statue? Well, I'll tell you why. Number one, that golden statue is long gone 
And number two, King Nebuchadnezzar is long gone as well. He has no claim on your life. He is not the king. All we see here in Daniel 3 is something set up by someone. And the emphasis here is the word set up. Nine times, Daniel tells us in this chapter, nine times he uses that word set up. And and we think it's bad English to repeat the same word again and again and again. But actually, when it comes to the Bible, it's really, really helpful because it helps us hone in on what the writer is trying to emphasize here. And so let's have a look. It's off the lips of Daniel in verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar, up on the screen, made an image of gold 60 cubits high, 6 cubits wide, and set it up in the plain of Dura on the province of Babylon. It's off the lips of the, of the herald who tells the crowd, you know, the, the, the new order, Daniel 5, 3 verse 5, you must fall down and worship the image of God that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. It's off the astrologer's lips as well. Those dibber-dobbers who, who, who dob in those three guys in verse 12. They, referring to the Daniel's three friends, they neither serve your gods, King Nebuchadnezzar, nor worship the image of gold you have set up. There it is again. Of course, Nebuchadnezzar says it himself too in verse 14. Is it true, he asks Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of God I have set up. And finally, Daniel's three mates in verse 18. They look Nebuchadnezzar square in the eye and they say to him, you are not the king. We will not serve your gods. We won't worship the image of God that you have set up. So why the repetition? Why is Daniel saying this again and again and again? Well, I think part of the reason why he does that is because he wants us to remember what he just said in Daniel chapter 2. It's meant to trigger our minds to recall these words up on the screen. Praise be to the the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He sets up kings and deposes them. Make no mistake, friends, here, what Daniel is doing, he is underlining, he is bolding, he is highlighting that, sure, Nebuchadnezzar can set up things, but it's God who sets up kings. It was God who set him up as king in the first place, and it is God who can just as easily give him the flick as king as well. Before Daniel chapter 3 is about three guys who go into a fiery furnace and live to tell the tale... Daniel 3 is about the battle of the gods. You know, you've got in the blue corner, Nebuchadnezzar. And in the red corner, you've got Yahweh, the god of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. And as this chapter unfolds, it becomes very loud and clear that this is no contest. No contest whatsoever. Because clue number one, did you notice that how Nebuchadnezzar's heavyweights... Right, the, 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 the prefects, the governors, the, the satraps, one minute you know, they're bowing down to the golden toothpick. Next minute, end of the chapter, in verse 27, we read how they are at the front of the line trying to see the work of what the real God has done in bringing these three guys out of the fire. Second clue we know is this, Nebuchadnezzar. Start of the chapter, he's an earthly king trying to assert his power. Come the end of the chapter, verse 28, he's done a complete 180. Listen to the words that come out of his his very own mouth in Daniel 3, 28. Praise. Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, who has sent his angels and rescued his servants. Nebuchadnezzar not only realizes the power of of God as the greater king, in fact, he even goes a a step further where we read in verse 29, a new law that Nebuchadnezzar makes. This new law will says that anyone who badmouths the God of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, it's instant death sentence. Now, you fast forward a few thousand years to where we are today and this, in this era of you know, fake news, what a relief, isn't it, that we don't have a fake God. We do not worship a fake God like the golden toothpick. No, we have the same God who calls the same shots here in Daniel chapter 3. This week I had a very 
uh, proud dad moment that I want to share with you. Uh, my son uh, was um, at school on Friday, and uh, one of his school friends decided to challenge him about his view on God. And he said to him, he said, God is dead and God is fake. To which my son turned around and said, no, 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 no. God is not fake. He's the God who created you. And God is alive because Jesus rose from the dead. As I said, proud dad moment. Let me share the other side of the coin. A not so proud moment is on my best days. Right? I, I would like to think that I'm all in on this God who is running the show in Daniel chapter 3, who puts Nebuchadnezzar in his place and who appoints kings just as easily as he removes them. But truth be told, if I'm completely honest with myself, I'm more like Nebuchadnezzar in this story, who forgets that there is a real God, who lives and thinks and, and acts as if you know, God's not there and I, th- I, I kind of want the attention all for myself. You know, that's all about me, myself and I. Nebuchadnezzar was the one who was craving all the attention and all the recognition. He wanted people to notice him. And I think in my worst moments, I'm definitely like that. Maybe you are too. Whether it's your spouse who who you want to to recognize or appreciate what you've done. Maybe it's your boss who who you want to notice all the extra hours of work that you've put in. Maybe it's desperately longing and aching for that that boyfriend or that girlfriend who'll fill that void of loneliness in your life. Lately for me, it's wanting my kids to do what I ask them to do. To tidy their room. (laughs) To do their homework. (laughs) To eat their breakfast. (laughs) See, deep down, I reckon the reason why Nebuchadnezzar sets up this golden toothpick, he goes to all that effort, all that grandeur, all that pomp and ceremony, ultimately so that people will notice him so that people will notice him. Well, Nebuchadnezzar has come and gone. He's come and gone, just like every other fake and phony and pretend God that's out there. And so the word for you and I today, friends, is it's time to stop running around and chasing those pretend, fake, phony, false gods to try and find our, our, our recognition or our status in them. For there is only one God, one very real God, a God who is slow to anger, a God who is compassionate, a God who is upright, who is merciful, who is gracious, who is faithful, who is forgiving. That's the sort of God that we worship. And this is the God to whom all people, all nations, everywhere will be called to give an account. One to whom every knee shall bow, willingly or unwillingly, that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So friends, let's be ready for that day. Let's continue to bow down daily and obey that wonderful God. And friends, if you're someone who who hasn't yet accepted that God, can I encourage you to do so now, today, willingly, before it's too late? Well, that brings us to truth number two. Where God says, I save. I'm in the business of moving people from death to life. That's just what I do. Do you remember Nebuchadnezzar in in chapter 3, verse 15? He's got the boldness, the cockiness, the the audacity to say these words about the God of, of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. What God will be able to rescue you from my hand, he says. Now, sure, Nebuchadnezzar might have the fire starter, he might have the jiffy and the matchstick in his hand, ready to go on the furnace, but that doesn't make him invincible. It doesn't make him invincible. And it's as if God kind of catches wind of this challenge that Nebuchadnezzar says, and he says, challenge accepted. I'll show you, Nebuchadnezzar, that not even a furnace that's heated seven times higher is going to stop me. Now, I take it that all of us here know how fire works. Right? You've seen a fire, you know how that works, that, that things get destroyed. Things burn, things perish, whether it's property, whether it's people. And it's the same here in Daniel 3. This is a real fire that these guys go through. And we know that because the three soldiers who lead these guys up to the fire, they lose their lives in the process of doing their job. 
And so what we have here is a God who intervenes, a God who breaks his own natural laws as a way of showing off, of just showing off how powerful he is, of flexing his muscles. Because boy, oh boy, this is a God who can save. He can save all right. We're talking about a God who, 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 who through that fourth figure that's there in the fire was somehow present with his people, you know, protecting them, walking alongside them. A God who can so protect his people that in chapter 3, verse 27, we read this on the, on the screen. I just love this verse. Fire. These guys walk out of, the, out, of the, out of the fire. Fire did not harm their bodies, the writer says. Not a single hair on their head was singed. Their robes weren't scorched at all. And not even the smell of fire was on them. What a beautiful description. Now, our family, right, we love toasting marshmallows in the fire pit, you know, but what we don't love is smelling like smoke afterwards. And we're not even in amongst the flames, right? We're just kind of hovering from the side. But these guys, they get amongst the flames and you can't even tell. You line up a before and after picture, there's no difference whatsoever. Daniel 3 screams loud and clear, we have a God who rescues, we have a God who saves, who rather than leaving us high and dry, is personally committed to saving his people. He's a God who will see us through thick and thin. And we know that because we see it ultimately in the Lord Jesus. We see it in his birth where he permanently sides with humanity and enters our broken world. We see it in his death on a cross where Jesus takes our blame and suffers and absorbs every single bit of judgment that was deserved rightly for us. And we see it in his resurrection where sin, where death, where Satan is conquered and Jesus is victorious and is raised to that throne. As many of you know, we've been on a journey with our, our sick daughter, uh, Evie. And uh, actually, most of this sermon this week was written bedside um, at Mount Druitt Hospital, um, which turned out to be actually, I think, God's way of reinforcing this point home for me, that God is a God who saves. Because there I am in amongst the hospital, right? I'm seeing ambulances come and go. I'm seeing doctors and nurses come by. I'm seeing medical treatment. I'm seeing equipment being administered. I'm, uh, you know, tests being performed. And I'm sitting there, I'm realising that, you know, I, I thank God for Mount Druid Hospital and all their wonderful staff, the medical, we've been tremendously blessed by them, okay? But they don't save lives into eternity. They don't, sadly. <laughs> they prolong life, yes. But only God is the one who can save lives on and on and on into eternity. And we've been reading a psalm each day for each day that Evie's been alive. So day 68 on Wednesday, Psalm 68. And I came across these wonderful verses. This is God's perfect timing up on the screen. Praise be to the Lord, to God our Saviour, who daily bears our burdens. Our God is a God who saves. Our God is a God who saves. From the Sovereign Lord comes escape from death. Friends, we have a God who can, who does, and who will save, because he is a God who saves. God is definitely, definitely not like this guy up on the screen. His name is Peter Chamberlain. Peter Chamberlain was the guy who invented forceps. Now, in case you don't know what forceps are, basically salad spoons that basically help guide a baby out during labour. And I won't show you a picture of that just to spare you. But the thing about Peter Chamberlain is this, is that he had invented forceps and kept it to himself. For a hundred years, this was a family secret that only he and his family knew about. You think about all the women, all the babies over those hundred years who could have been alive if they had known about the forceps, if he had shared it with people. Think about it. God saves. Peter Chamberlain does not save. 
Well, one fiery furnace later and one fiery Nebuchadnezzar later too, God brings Nebuchadnezzar to realise, chapter 3, verse 29, that no other God can save in this way. No other God can save. And so, friends, if you're someone here who has not yet been saved by this wonderful God, Please do so today. Please come and chat to Steve or or to I after the service. We'd love to have a chat with you. But if you're here as someone who is saved, who is saved, then I want you to know, as we often say at the front here, that God has not only saved you, he wants you to know that you are saved. There is tremendous comfort and assurance in that fact. And the wonderful thing is that this God is still continuing to save and to rescue people today. Because we live in a time of reaping. We live in a time of of seeing people with our very own eyes move from death to life. That's what inspires us to remain optimistic. That's what inspires us to keep on sniffing around for opportunities to share Jesus with with those people who we know and love. That's what encourages and, and keeps us to pray for boldness, to not chicken out of opportunities that God brings our way to speak about Jesus. It all stems from who this God is. That he's a God who saves. I mean, why else do we set God-desired outcomes to see a thousand new people, one for Jesus in Western Sydney? Why else do we, do we plant a church over in Southwest Sydney? Why else do we explore the possibilities of adding another service at 4 p.m. here at Rudy Hill? It's why so many of you put your hand up and serve in different ministry teams, whether that's the scripture team that goes into the schools around here to share Jesus with, with kids. It's why many of you um, uh, share Jesus with those, from an inter- those who have an intellectual disability. It's why many of you serve on morning tea teams, on coffee teams, on set-up and pack-up teams. It's so that you can provide a space and a place on Sundays and throughout the week where people can talk about Jesus. It's why many of you welcome because you want to reflect the welcoming face of our God. It's why we've got three Explaining Christianity courses happening at the moment. One beginning this Tuesday, as was announced, in, and with a Mandarin translation on, for, for women. One on Wednesdays during craft group. And one on Wednesday night. And in fact, the, this Wednesday night group, it's up to week four this week. But back when it began in week one, the day before, right, there was maybe, and it was just maybe, one person who was going to come. But the next night, and this shows just how committed God is to rescuing his people, a maybe one person ended up with 17 on that night in the space of a very short space of time. 17 people said, yes, I want to hear about Jesus. That's a wonderful thing. It would be a great thing, wouldn't it, to, to be praying this week on Wednesday that God would save all 17 of those people who come back to explaining Christianity. Well, we've seen truth number one, God is real, so bow down and obey Him only. Truth number two, God saves. And so let's be optimistic in seeing the name of Jesus go forward. Now for the lie. If there's something that we wished God had said, it'd be this, don't you think? That God is committed to making life as easy as possible for us. That, that He's here to kind of meet our needs and, 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 and fit around us. But that is the lie, sadly, that we keep on tripping over and over and over again. That following God will just be a walk in the park. That, that you know, every single prayer that we pray is going to be answered according to what we want. That, 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 that we're bulletproof. That there's no pain or suffering or sickness in this life. Well, Daniel 3 puts a bullet to that idea, doesn't it? Because on this day, on this particular day, these God-fearing, these God-honouring men did not take a walk in a park. They they took a walk into a furnace. And you have a think about it. When they heard that command from Nebuchadnezzar to either bow or to burn, you have a think about what would have been going through their heads. Now, we don't know in many respects because the text doesn't tell us, but you can imagine, can't you, that what was going through their head, they could have thought, you know, let's just do a quick bow and, and, and we'll have many more years of life. They could have thought that. Or they could have thought, um, you know, we've lost everything we have to these guys in Babylon. They now rule over us, so we better respect, we better follow the laws of the land, we'll bow down. Could have done that. Or they could have gone, you know, let's just do you know, a quick bow and then we'll say sorry to God and we'll say, God, we didn't really mean it in our hearts with all sincerity, 
we know that you are the true and living God. They could have done all those things. But what we do know from the text, it was bow or burn. There wasn't a third option of blending in. So rather than bow, blend in, burn, no, no, bow, burn. And that is what leads them to say in verse 16, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into that burning furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it and he will deliver us from your majesty's hands. <laughs> Talk about guts, right? To look King Nebuchadnezzar, the one who's got the, got, you know, can sentence you to death, look him square in the eye and say, you are not the king. These guys stand on their convictions and they do it because of the two truths we've seen already, that God is real and that God saves. And just when we thought they were really, really impressive guys, they go one step further, verse 18. They say this, even if, right? But even if our God doesn't save us from the flames, we want you to know, Nebuchadnezzar, that we simply will not serve your gods and nor will we worship the image of God that you have set up. This is a picture of loyalty to the death, of no compromise whatsoever. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego refuse to buy the lie that God is committed to their comfort. See, they don't think for a minute that somehow God owes them, do they? That, you know, that they've, they've obeyed God's commands, they've, they've read their Bibles, they've prayed, they've turned up to church, they're on the rosters, and now it's time for God to, to, to pay them back. Look at all the stuff that I've done for you, God. They don't think like that, do they? Now, before we kind of hold these guys up on too high of a pedestal, let's remember that they were sinners, just like you and I. And so what the purpose of these guys is in Daniel chapter 3 is to point us to a model, a model of someone who is sinless and is impeccably faithful, just like they were. One who, as Philippians 2 puts it, was obedient to death, even death on a cross. And so I want to say to all of us that live, you know, kind of this side of Jesus' death and resurrection, that we have every reason to hang in there, don't we? Every reason to hang in there. Because if you've taken the hand of Jesus, you are part of the winning team. You are on the winning team, friends. We're, it may not look like it today, you know, tomorrow, next week, but into eternity, which really counts, you are definitely on the winning team. And so sticking your neck out for Jesus, you know, speaking up about him, it's worth it. It's worth it. Satan has been defeated. Your name is written in the book of life and God has a room prepared for you in his house. And so in the meantime, well, we're not to be surprised at what comes our way. We can be sad, yes, we can be saddened by the stories we hear of persecution and things like that around the world and, and in our own lives, but don't be shocked. Be sad, but not shocked. 1 Peter 4.12, this is our last Bible verse. Peter says this, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Instead, rejoice. Rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Can you see how Peter normalizes the situation here for us? He wants us to go in with saying, this is situation normal. The opposition we face, the trials we face, the testing, the temptations, don't be surprised one bit. They're not strange. <laughs> They're not strange at all. They're to be expected and embraced if you're a child of God. Whether you're a Christian here in Western Sydney or whether you're a Christian over in the most dangerous part of the world right now to be a Christian in North Korea. Same thing. Peter says these things so that we don't become bitter, but we become better. And as weird as it sounds, he actually expects us to rejoice in those things, rejoice in those sufferings. Because as you do so, you're doing exactly what your Saviour does. The one who suffered, but then was raised to glory. And that's the path and that's the trajectory that you and I are on too. Let me end with, by sharing with you a personal sort of situation that kind of is similar to what's going on here in Daniel 3. 
Only for me, this was not a life and death situation. So we're not even talking in the same ballpark. But um, you might come from a culture like I do. Chinese culture is big on something called ancestor worship, ancestor veneration. And um, I can remember as a kind of a nine, ten-year-old boy um, being taken to my grandparents' cemetery um, over in Rookwood. And uh, what we would do each time is that we would kind of lay out food uh, and we would also um, have some paper money that would be burnt in a, in a bucket, in a container, and that we would also bow down and we would burn incense as well to our, our, dead, our dead ancestors. Uh, we'd pay our respects. Now, the thinking behind this practice, uh, you may be familiar with it, is that you are providing for your dead, dead ancestors. So you're providing them food, you're giving them money, uh, and in a way, you're sustaining them so that they can influence you know, the gods, the gods who will either bless you or curse you. That's the thinking behind it. It's very superstitious. And um, uh, my parents took us along, and, and um, they're not yet saved, um, but they took us along. And, and I remember my brother asking um, my dad one time, he said, Dad, why are we doing this? And, and my dad said, it's just something that we've grown up with, so we're passing it on to you. Um, now, neither of us, we don't, we don't go to the, to the cemetery and do that anymore. Uh, my parents do. Um, but I've not had that conversation about why I don't do that to my dad yet. I've not had that conversation yet. But I want to have that conversation now, after reading Daniel 3. Because I want to say to my dad and to my mum that I don't do this because of one simple reason. That there is only one God. There is only one God, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The God who judges over the living and the dead. The God who is alive, well and ruling this universe. The God who is very much real. The God who very much saves. And the God who is very much committed to his glory over and above my comfort. So why don't we pray to that God right now? Please join with me. Father, we want to pause and say that you are our God and you are a wonderful God. You are a God who saves. We thank you, Father, that the same God who, who shows up in Daniel 3 is the God who shows up in our lives today, no matter what we might be going through right now. Father, we want to say especially thank you for saving us. Thank you for sending your son into this world to rescue and redeem us. And Father, we want to pray especially that you would save all 17 of those people who come along to explain Christianity on Wednesday. We pray that you would save those who are currently going through the ECs in, on Tuesdays and on, on Wednesday daytime as well. We pray, God, that you would save 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 new disciples in amongst Sydney's West. Father, we know you can do that. And so we come before you confident that you are a God who saves. And we thank you for this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.